Sunday morning, the book of Revelation. The Revelation in verse 1 of chapter 1 of the letter written by the Apostle John. The Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, that's us, things which must shortly come to pass. And he, that's God, sent and signified. So the authenticity of what we are reading was validated by a holy angel. And this was sent unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and everything that he saw. So, so the word of God and the truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ and then everything that we're going to see as we read these words was validated, that is, signified by a holy angel. And then we get in verse number three, the first, the first of seven beatitudes. The first of seven beatitudes in this book. Blessed, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So, so he's pronouncing a blessing, a spiritual blessing on the one that reads and everyone who hears the words of this prophecy. But it's not just enough to hear them. And they have to keep those things which are written herein, for the time is at hand. Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus, to our assembly. Send your Holy Spirit. Manifest your grace. Make, make it come alive. And as Steve prayed, I join him. And praying, oh God, that if there's someone here that's lost, if there's someone here that's unconverted, if there's someone here whose faith is shallow and empty and, and vain, God, call them to yourself. Do, oh God, the work that only you can do, that which cannot be manifested through some, some invitation, but is necessary only by the Holy Spirit. Bless the preaching this morning. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> seven Beatitudes. Seven bestowals of blessing to those in this book. Seven of them. And we're going to go through them this morning in part. And the next week we'll pick it up. We're going to cover all seven. And I'm going to do my best to Create linkage so it doesn't seem like independent, but they're actually communicating a, uh, a holistic message. So the word, let's start with the word blessed. The word blessed. Uh, we should not be surprised to find seven beatitudes, that's the bestowal of blessing, in the book that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This should not be a surprise to us. And the reason it should not be a surprise to us is because Matthew 3.1 Matthew 3, 1 is the beginning of Jesus' preaching ministry. And let's go ahead and turn there. Matthew 3, 1. And, and this preaching ministry begins, make sure you hold your place in, in Revelation, in case you struggle with finding it again. And um, uh, Matthew 3, 1, this is the beginning of Jesus' preaching ministry. And, and we read... Um, did I say three one? Uh, five, rather. Sorry, five. Yeah, five one. That's correct. Five one. Three is where Jesus gets baptized. Four is the temptation of Christ. And then five is where the preaching ministry begins. So five one. All right. 
And seeing the multitude, he, Jesus, went up into the mountain. He sits down. His disciples come up to him. And he opens his mouth. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn. They shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful. They shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart. They shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteous sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you and falsely accuse you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. So there we have blessing after blessing after blessing bestowed upon the people of God in relationship and in proportion to the degree to which they do things or are part of what's described there. So, if we have Jesus Christ having this... What are you guys mechanics? What are you doing on that side of the church? This is not where you sit. Who's in your seat? I will move them. Tell me. Who, who's, this is your section right here. Next Sunday, be here, okay? I don't know. Guests, bring them with you. But this is where the McCags sit, all right? Be in your place. Nicely done. Nicely done. Very good. good. He wins. Folks, I like you to sit in the same spot because I'm used to you being there, okay? And if you're not there, then I want to notice, okay? Uh, so, so just sit where you're supposed to sit and, and do it consistently. All right. We should not be surprised that this book called The Revelation of Jesus Christ has the bestowal of blessings if the man Jesus Christ bestowed blessings when he was on this earth. If the man Jesus Christ has this incredible teaching ministry in which he creates what blessed is, we should expect that the revelation of Jesus Christ would also have that blessed language in it. In fact, I would argue that if they don't have it, we'd wonder why is there such a disconnect? Because this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to do my best throughout this entire sermon series to show you the continuity between the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because I want you to see that this book, Revelation, is not some disjointed, wild, weird book at the end of your Bible that nobody can understand. That it has value to us. Turn to Matthew chapter 16 because I want to unpack just a little bit more about what we mean by blessed. And you should know this chapter if you don't add it to your bucket list. You don't have to know all the chapters in the Bible, but there are some that you absolutely should know, and this is one of them. When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea in verse number 13 of chapter 16, he asked the question, who do men say that the Son of Man is? In verse 14, some give all these different answers. Some say you're a Baptist, Elias. Others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he turns to Peter and says, but whom? To, to the disciples. He turns to the disciples and asks them collectively, but who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that I am? And then we read, Simon Peter steps up to the plate and provides, thou art the Christ, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. You are the son of the living God. Now let me ask you this question. Is Peter an agnostic? No, he's not an agnostic. Is Peter an atheist? What about a Muslim? Would you describe Peter as a Muslim in this verse? No, not a Muslim, not an atheist, not an agnostic. How would you then describe Peter in this verse? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. How would you describe Peter at this point? How would you describe Peter? A believer. Let's be more specific because you can believe in a lot of stuff. Born again. He's a Christian. He's a follower of Christ. He's a follower of Christ. Now let's hear what 
Jesus says to him, having now identified him as a follower of Christ. Blessed art thou, reading in the very next verse, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. Nod your head if that's what your Bible says. Yes. Blessed are you. So now what we understand is that coming to a realization of who Jesus is and making that our faith puts us in a state of being what, church? Blessed. blessed. A state of being blessed. A state of being blessed. So your ESV study Bible says that blessed is more than a temporary circumstantial feeling of happiness. Don't think about pink Cadillacs right now. That's not what we're talking about. Don't think about five-bedroom homes and swimming pools. That's not what we're talking about right now. Okay? The apostles are going to give their lives for the gospel, and Jesus calls them blessed. He calls them blessed. So whatever you're thinking about blessing, and I want some blessing from God, okay, get that out of your mind. And think about blessed as a state where my relationship with God is one of rightness. That the vertical relationship between me and God is good. I'm not going to experience the wrath of God. I'm in a state of being blessed. That's what we need to be thinking about when we look at these Beatitudes. So we're going to, because of the, the, the pronouncement is, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. So we're going to read from this pulpit on Sunday mornings every word in 22 chapters. We're going to go through the whole thing because there is a blessing pronounced for those who read and hear this book. And I'm so thankful that you don't have to interpret it correctly to get that blessing. All you got to do is read it. That's it. So there may be a Sunday morning where we just read and read and read and read. And I say, you're dismissed. <laughs> because that's all I got to do is just read it. All right. Because if you haven't studied this book, it is hard. It's really hard. One person told me, when you said Revelation, I dropped my head and couldn't believe we were going there on Sunday morning. And I understand. I don't know how I got here either, okay? I don't know how I made this commitment, all right? But we're here, and we're going to work through a very hard book. And I'm not, going to, I'm not going to tell you I have the right ideas all the time, and I'm not going to pretend like we're going to work through all these timelines and give you all this stuff. Because that is not our focus. All right? So will you, over the summer, through sermon audio, live web stream, and all that we make available, will you make a commitment to hear each word that is written in this book? And you can be on vacation and just check in. You can work and check in because we put it all online. So even if you have a bad Sunday and you're homesick and all that, you can stay with it. But there is a blessing for those who will study this book. And we want that blessing. So how serious will you take this study? Now that's your decision. The words of this prophecy. What's prophecy? It's a prediction of something to come. So I asked this morning, correctly interpreting the prophecies of this book makes what's teaching so difficult. For example, uh, what has already taken place? You say, why would you ask that question? Well, did you happen to notice as we were looking at chapter number one, that crazy word shortly? What must shortly come to pass? There are things in the first three chapters that have already happened. He tells the church you're going to be in tribulation for 10 days. You can't take that 10 days and turn it into lifetimes or eras or some wild idea in order to somehow make it fit your grid. So, so what is yet to take place? How little should the words of this book be interpreted? Are days really days? Are years years? Is the beast a beast? Is the book of life really a book? Is the tree a tree? And it literally goes on and on and on. Because the entire book is written with such language to create pictures. He wants you to see what he saw. 
So whenever you're trying to get someone to see what you saw, and this is, we don't even understand this world today. Because let's face it, we take more pictures than we write. So I never have to worry about trying to describe something to you because you know what I do, Adam? I pull out my phone and I snap a shot, and then one second later, you have it. So when was the last time you tried to describe something to someone using only words? Because that's what Revelation is. He has these amazing visions and sees all this stuff, and he's got to give you words so that you can see it the way he saw it. Okay? So that's what makes this so hard. Now, over here on this side, what is the most important prophecy in this book? What is the most important? Yell it out to me. What's the most important prophecy in this book? The return of Christ. The return of Christ. The return of Christ. So it's really easy to get bogged down into all the details that you lose sight that the primary message of this book is that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. So now, notice in verse number 3, it's not enough just to hear these words. There's that obnoxious conjunction there, A and D. So you've got to hear what's in this book, and you must keep things that are written therein. Now I want you to hold your place in 1-1. And then while holding your place, I want you to turn back to Revelation 22. I want you to hold your place in in 1-1. And I want you to turn back, turn back to Revelation 22-7. I'm going to show you Beatitude number 6. There are seven, and I want to show you Beatitude number 6. So what I've done is I've folded that middle section in half so that I can look at 1, 3, and 22, 7 at the same time. If you do the same thing, if you take the middle section of your pages, you can look at them both together. Verse 7 of chapter 22. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So notice, please, Chapter 1 opens with a blessing to those who keep. And chapter 22 closes with a blessing to those who keep. So 1 and 6 are virtually the same beatitude. Everyone follow me? 1 and 6, 1 says, hear it and keep it. And now that you're at the end of the book, the assumption is if you got all the way back here, you've heard it. So the last thing you're said, now you just keep what was written in here. So 6 and 1 are the same, and because they're the same, we're not going to deal with them independently. We're not going to deal with them independently. The focus is keeping the words. Now, turn back to Luke. Luke 11, while holding your spot. Now, don't lose Revelation because it's a hard book to find, and and, and you might not be able to find it again if, uh, if you lose it. Uh, TJ, I'm holding up my sarcasm sign right now, okay? I'm holding up my sarcasm sign, okay? Luke 11, verse 27. And it it came to pass in Luke 11, I'll give you another second just to get there. And it came to pass that he spake these words. So so Jesus is, is speaking. And this woman comes up and she lifts up her voice, kind of interrupting, and says... Blessed is the woman that bare thee and, and the one that nursed you. Well, okay, well, that's good. Blessed is the one that bare the Messiah and that nursed. And Jesus says, but, <laughs> yes, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. It's virtually the same message, isn't it? It's virtually the same message. This woman puts emphasis on mama, Mary. And Jesus says, that's not where you need to put your focus. You want to be blessed? Because you can't have the Son of God. Where do you need? You read the Word of God, hear the Word of God, study the Word of God, and what? And what? And keep it. And keep it. So I have three questions for you this morning. Question number one is, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Because we do. In this church, we do. 
we are absolutely convinced that God gave us this book and it is the word of God, that it is inerrant, that it is infallible, that it is inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, that it is Revelation, uh, Genesis 1.1, chapter 22 of Revelation, everything in between, it is the word of God. It doesn't contain the word of God. It is the word of God. So now question number two is, do you seek to know what it contains or says? Do you seek to know what it contains or says? Is learning the Word of God part of who you are? Do you care what it says? Does it matter to you what it says? Question number three, is there a focus on keeping it in your life? If we had a GoPro pro camera, Jack, what are you doing over there? You don't sit there. Okay, would you like me to tell you where you sit? Because I'll tell you, you sit on this side right over here, and you sit generally back where the Hubbards sit. That's where you sit, okay? I know Ty's your buddy, and maybe he's feeling a little lonely, and you're being his temporary pew buddy this morning, okay? But we're looking for pew buddies of the opposite sex, okay? <laughs> Just so we're clear, all right? All right, sidebar. Sit where you're supposed to sit, all right? We got it? Blues, you're right in your spot. Occupy it consistently, okay? All right. Now, um, is there a focus on keeping the Word of God in your life? Chuck, we're going to get a drone, and we're going to mount a camera on that thing, and we're going to follow you for a week. We're going to follow him at work. We're going to follow him at home. We're going to follow him as he's driving. We're going to follow him. And then we're going to take that week in review and we're going to say, does it look like Chuck was attempting to follow the truths of the Word of God in the way he conducted his life, in the manner in which he lived, in the manner in which he interacted, in the way he talked to people, in the way he engaged them, in his work ethic, in his honesty, in his patience, in the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not enough to know. There is a consistent message in the Word of God on keeping, doing. And we're going to see this the more we dig. So is there a focus on keeping it in your life? So now I asked this morning, what is an example of something that I can find in this book that I can keep? Well, here's one. Revelation chapter 2. Be faithful until God calls you home. Amen. We're not looking for no five years. We ain't looking for no ten years. We're not looking for twelve and a half years and now you're good enough. How long do you have to serve God for, Josh? How long? Your whole life. Yep, until he calls you home. To the end. You got to go the distance. You got to go. It, this is not enough to have a VBS experience for a day. A moment at summer camp doth not save. Okay? You uh, clearly can be born again on a moment, but there is a clear biblical admonishment that we must endure, that we go the distance, that we are characterized by this endurance. Be faithful until the death and I will give you the crown of life. Sometimes if you study this, you'll see some nonsense. And this is kind of what they do. And this is just so ridiculous. What they'll do is they'll attempt to create that as a separate reward. So what you have is save people who did not endure, and then you got really faithful, super-duper Christians, and they get the crown of life. Folks, the crown of life is like the tree of life. It is a means of communicating eternal life. It is not something separate for super-duper Christians. Okay, It is eternal life. The reason we have these words like crown and tree in this book is because this is an amazingly prophetic book that has all this language that is imaginary, that is to create mental pictures in your mind. So this crown should not be understood to be literal, but in sense should be understood as the culmination or the reward of serving God till the end. There ain't 18 billion crowns in a warehouse in heaven all stacked up and organized by size, and you're going to CIF in order to get your crown. Okay? It's not like that at all. Here's something you can do. You can be zealous and repent. Here's something you can do. Be zealous and repent. 
Here's something you can do. Fear God. Fear God. Why aren't you behaving that way? Because I fear God. Why are you doing the right thing? Because I fear God. You say, I don't like that motivation. The Bible tells us that. That we are to have an appropriate reverential fear for who God is. That we are not to be obnoxious in who we are and with an arrogance. We are to fear God. But wait a minute. And give him the glory. And wait a minute. Not only to give him the glory, but worship him. And I want to tell you something. I watch you guys when we're worshiping the Lord. I watch you. I look. I turn around and stare. And I wonder to myself how you can be saved and not sing. How do you get to be saved and not sing? How do we spend 20 minutes worshiping the Lord and your mouth is silent? Now look, folks, let me be clear. You don't have to be... You don't have to be like that. But let me also be clear. From your heart, there needs to be affection coming out of your heart to your God. Affection. And I can't see that affection, and you can't see that affection. But most of the time, affection manifests itself in the way you look. You give somebody a hug, and you can tell, that's a fake hug. Yeah, that's a little sidebar, just kind of placating them. Or, man, he's crazy about him. And you can tell. So I'm always confused about folks in the auditorium on Sunday morning who seem to profess themselves to be Christians and are not manifesting any evidence of affection for God in the singing of his word. Have you read the Psalms? Praise ye the Lord. Praise him. Praise him with your big foot. Praise him with your hands. Praise him with your hands. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Right. Here's another one. Here is a call for endurance. You know what endurance is. Endurance is what you need to go the distance. You know why you don't finish a race? Because you run out of endurance. Endurance is what takes you the distance. We build our endurance. We stay the faith. We go the distance. And notice the description of those who endure. One more time, they keep the commandments of God and their faith is in Jesus Christ. Beatitude number two. Turn back to Revelation, please. Beatitude number two. We're going all the way to chapter 14. We're going all the way to chapter 14. So number one was in Revelation 1. Number six, which we covered only because their length, is in Revelation 22. Now we're going to chapter 14. Revelation 14. We're doing seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. And we're doing them over two Sundays. So if you're a guest or visitor, next Sunday's message will be uploaded to our website. We have a sermon audio page called Berean Baptist Church. You can find us. All the messages are there. Verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying, remember this is Beatitude number two. Maybe you write it down in your Bible. Put a little number two there so you don't lose sight of this a week from now. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write. All right, so how do we get this? He told him, write it down. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, they're going to rest. They will rest from their labors and their works, their deeds do follow them. So there are three things we want to unpack in this, in, this, in this beatitude. The first thing, die in the Lord. Second thing, look at the glorious promise of rest. Number three, look at the reality that our deeds follow us into eternity. Our deeds follow us into eternity. So if you were to die this very moment, and you have a massive heart attack, massive heart attack and you die this very moment would you die in the Lord 
Would you die in the Lord? Would you die in the Lord? Are you dying in the Lord? Are you in the Lord? This is the question right now. Someone says, Pastor Sean, why don't you do an invitation? This is an invitation right now. In the middle of the sermon, we're stopping and doing an invitation. You never ask about anybody getting saved. You don't pay attention to my preaching. Very seldom do we not have a sermon in which we're not talking about putting your faith in Christ. You're just expecting we wait until 12 o'clock. That's the magic hour when you can get saved every Sunday. Look at it. You've got to die in the Lord to be blessed. You've got to die in the Lord. Clearly, you understand the implications of the promise that those who die in the Lord are blessed. By default, there must be those who do not die in the Lord and are not blessed. They're not blessed. But it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Let me explain to you how worse it is. In Matthew 25, we get this amazing parable or story. It's the judgment. A narrative would be a better word. Of the sheep and the goats. And after the separation of the sheep from the goats, Jesus says these words. He says, depart from me, you cursed. This is what we want today. This is what we'd love to be today. Yes, you Christians can have a state of blessed. We're going to make all you guys blessed. But over here, we just want neutrality. I want to live my life, and then I die, and there's nothing more. Let's talk about that for just a moment. Would you stop right now and say, can you remember the time when you decided what gender you'd like to be before you were conceived? No? You don't remember that time? When you made a decision of the gender that you would prefer to have before you were conceived? All right, well, let's ask this question. Do you remember when you told God the ethnicity that you would like to have? You said, God, I'd like to have this ethnicity. How many of you can remember when you made that decision? You made the decision of the ethnicity that you would like. Do you remember? All right. How many of you can say in this row, we're speaking with Bob, I chose the month I'd like to be born. I kind of like Leo. And so I chose Leo. And, you know, what are the other silly things? Pisces and all those nonsense. I'd like to be that. Any of you make that decision? Precious, did you decide that? All right. so, So here's my point. If you had nothing to do with coming into this world, Why do you think you're going to have control of your destiny on the other side? Since you didn't pick your gender, and you didn't pick your ethnicity, and you didn't pick your birth month, and you didn't pick the country you were born into, and you didn't pick your mom and dad. In other words, since you had no control of coming into this world, why do you think that you're going to get to decide anything on the other side? I need to remind you that God chose everything coming into this world, and God is going to choose where you go when you leave this world. And so when he says, depart from me, you curse it into eternal fire, prepared for the devil's angels, there ain't a middle ground. You folks think that for some reason there's a middle ground. Like, I know, Pastor Sean, I'm not a super Christian. I'm not one of those that's going to be uber blessed over here. That's for those Wednesday night folks. But certainly, don't call me cursed. And so what you've created is like this middle ground right here. I'm not blessed, but I'm not cursed. Folks, there is no DMZ. There's no D. Miller's Eye Zone between North and South Korea in eternity. You're either blessed or you're cursed. It's it, that simple. You say, I don't like that. It's not my book. Okay? I didn't write it, I'm just preaching it. You're either blessed. Or you're cursed. Well, I want to be blessed. Then get in Christ. Then get in Christ. Get in him. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So all be made alive. Look at the second half. What a promise. A promise of rest. Imagine for just a moment. Wherever your current state of life is. And I told you, 
Hansel, you're going to have that job in this state forever. Think what I'm talking about right now. The very idea that things can change gives us hope. And we live on hope. We live on hope. If I told you that your current state of Alzheimer's is never going to end, your current state of prostate cancer is never going to end, your back problems are never ending, Chuck, you will deal with them for all eternity. Your crazy work schedule will go on for eternity. There'll never be a time that you work less. You will always have that unbelievable demanding job 70 hours a week forever. The reason you endure it is because of the hope of a change. Think about what I'm saying to you. And the reason you can do that is because you have a promise from God's word that those people who serve him are given rest. You see patients all day long. Folks, can you imagine if there was never a Saturday, if there was never a Sunday, if 365 days a year, all you had to do was hear people's problems with no Sabbath, you would go crazy. Am I wrong? Teachers, teachers, here's a teacher right here. The summer, <laughs> glory, hallelujah, it's May. <laughs> and I get June and July and a little bit of August. Woo. Am I wrong? Why do you think they give soldiers 30 days? Because you need a Sabbath. How many look forward to four-day weekends with a passion? It's a break. Let me look, look, that they may rest from their labors. This promise of rest is huge. It's awesome. It's incredible. But he's not done. Your deeds follow you. Your deeds. Deed is something that is done. Something that is done. I have enough time. Run back to Matthew 25. Run back to Matthew 25. Everybody, run back to Matthew 25. This is everybody. Not, you don't get an exemption on your pew. Paul, are you turning? Matthew 25. Okay. Back to Matthew 25. Now, this is the chapter that we just quoted, cursed. But I want to show you something. Because a deed is something that is done. A deed is something that is done. So he divides the sheep on the right and the goats on the left in verse number 13 of chapter 25. He says to the sheep, Come, ye blessed my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you did something about it. What'd they do? They fed him. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was stranger, and you provided hospitality. I was naked, and you gave me some clothing. I was sick, and you came to the hospital. I was in prison, and you did something. Do you understand? It's a deed. He just described six righteous deeds. Now, wait a minute. We're not done. Let's keep reading. And the righteous answered and said, when did we do all this? In verse 40, he says, in as much as you've done it, what is a deed? It's something that we what? Do. And as much as you have done it to one of the least of my brethren, you've done it. What is that? That's a deed unto who? Me. And those deeds follow them into eternity. And to the others... Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did nothing. You did nothing. There cannot be in your mind this morning this giant disconnect between I am a Christian, but I don't do anything. I don't know if the Army still talks about this, but I think I'll remember this for the rest of my life. I remember as a young sergeant, we were told it matters what we be and what we know and what we do. Be, no, do. That was drilled in my head. Be, no, do. Uh, who are you? What do you know? What do you do? If we took that drone and we followed you this week, would your life look like the life of a Christian? 
Would we see you doing Christ-like things? Do you have any righteous deeds that are following you into eternity? Beatitude number three. Turn to chapter 16. By the way, there's kind of informal rule in this church, and it goes something like this. When we don't have a Sunday night service, the preacher gets a little bit more time on Sunday morning. Okay? All right, it's kind of like an informal norm. All right? If we don't have a Sunday night service, he can take some of the Sunday night uh, service time and bring it to Sunday morning. You know what I mean? Like in the Senate when they say, I'll give my time to so-and-so, you know, and they allocate it like that. Revelation 16, I'm going to need just a couple minutes afternoon. Give everyone in the nursery a warning order. Give them another Scooby snack and, 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 and get them ready. Beatitude number three. Behold, I come as, I'm reading chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches, stays awake, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, folks, this is normally this idea of behold, I come as a thief. This is normally the biggest argument for the sudden rapture, pre-tribulation, evacuation, snatch and grab kind of a plan. And the argument goes something like this. I'm looking for him, but there are no signs because he's coming as a thief, and the only way that can happen is if he comes before the tribulation. I need you to go back to 2 Thessalonians, please. I need you to go back to 2 Thessalonians. This might be a little bit harder to find, but I need you to get there. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians. So you're going to do that, um, um, go eat popcorn. So that's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, um, Philipp, uh, 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 Colossians, Philippians, uh, and then, and then you're going to, Colossians is like half a page in my Bible. Look at that, Marcus. Uh, I can't preach from Colossians with this Bible. Uh, I don't know what, ha what happened, but it's not there. Um, yes, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. Okay, I'm going to teach you something right now. I hope you're ready. Of the times and the seasons, brethren, Paul says, I have no need to write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So let's be clear. Paul and John are singing from the same sheet of music. John says Jesus is coming as a thief. And Paul says, yes, he is. Everybody agrees he's coming as a thief. Okay, let's keep reading. For when, now notice please, they... They, not us, this is a different group of people. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes on them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. All right, so there's a group of people to which Jesus does come as a thief in the night. These are the ones that are saying peace and safety. They're not looking for Jesus. They know nothing of Jesus. Their God is the God of peace and safety. And they're not looking for Jesus. But, verse 4, but you, not, not they, us, you. You who? What's your Bible say? Look at your Bible right now. What's your Bible say? Say it loud, John. Brethren. You brethren. So now these are the brothers and sisters in Christ. You are not in the darkness. You're not in the darkness such that that day comes upon you like a thief. That day's not going to overcome you. So is it true that Jesus comes as a thief? Yes, but not to you. Amen. Not to you. Amen. You know why? Because you're expecting him. You're expecting him, Chuck. Your Bible says he's coming back. So you're not surprised when he comes back. You know your Bible. Now, he does, does he come as a thief? Yes, he does. But not to us, sister. And the reason he doesn't come to us is because we're awake. We're watching. Blessed is the one who stays awake. Now, staying awake there is not like I don't ever go to sleep. That is the ridiculous understanding. We, we certainly don't have that interpretation. Staying awake is an awareness. Okay? You know he's coming. Be aware of this. 
God does never, does never, whoo, that's not good at all. It's summer, okay, I am mad. No grammar in the summer, glory to God. I got to like August 21st to get it right, okay. Rebecca, I get a bye, you heard that, right, okay, a complete bye. Listen, God doesn't call us to sell everything, go sit on the rooftop and wait for Jesus. In the book of Luke, we're told to occupy. We're told to occupy. Now, as we're occupying, we keep a watchful eye for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not dumb. We know the signs are. But we're still building. We're still selling. We're still trading. We're still going about life. We're still making a difference for the kingdom of God. We haven't decided that, well, because Jesus is coming, I'm not going to do anything more. No more missionaries. No more building programs. We're done. No, we're still occupying. But as we occupy in the kingdom of God, we are aware of what's happening we're not clueless. We know our Bible promises is coming again. We know the revelation of some type of antichrist figure. And the greater degree to which the events happen is, I believe, the greater clarity will be provided to the believers as to what exactly is happening. So if this is not pertaining to me, then I don't need the same level of clarity that those that it did pertain to. What do you mean by that? In chapter number one, he says he's coming shortly. So there must be some type of application to those Christians in that lifetime. It has to be. And for them, they saw it crystal clear because it was for them. And the greater degree to which we are close and in it will be the greater degree to which the clarity will be provided to us. Okay? Because God is not a God that holds back from his people. The book of James promises that as we ask for wisdom, he gives it to us. So if we're diligently seeking to know the book of Revelation in proportion to wherever we're at in this timeline, then I believe that God will clearly reveal it to us. And the greater degree to which we're there is the greater degree to be clear to us. Now that's just my thoughts. Let me see if I have just one more thing. Oh my goodness. All right, I'm trying to make sure that we're right with the 830 service so that we're kind of together. So blessed is the one who stays awake. And then we've got this strange description, keeps his garments on. I just want to spend a minute here. and Well, that's just not true. A minute's a ridiculous amount of time. A couple minutes here, and then we'll go home. All right. Are we talking about clothes? Are we talking about keeping your jeans on? I mean, we got, we got and, and they go about naked and be exposed. What is going on here? What is keeping your garments on? What is John referring to? Okay, well, we're good. We're done. Let's go home. John answered it. That's it. We're finished right there, fam. We're done. And you're dismissed. Just kidding. Okay. All right. I'm going to hold my hands up like this. Back up. Because all y'all folks, I haven't even been over here at all. Like to, This side's been totally isolated. Very quickly. Two hands. There are two parallel tracks going on in the book of Revelation. All right. One is the garment you receive when you put your faith in Christ. And the other is the righteous deeds that you do. The righteous deeds that you do. Both of these are described in this book. Both of them are. In Revelation chapter 7, the saints wash their garments in the blood of the Lamb. In the blood of the Lamb. In the blood of the Lamb. In Matthew 22, write that down if you're going to study this week. Matthew 22, there's this incredible parable about a wedding. And all the guests get invited to this wedding. And he walks in at the end of the wedding and notices someone that does not have a wedding garment on. And they are cast out into outer darkness. So I believe that the wedding garment or the garment that's being described here is the garment you receive of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But wait a minute. It's not just that. In Revelation 19, let me see. No, I don't have it. In Revelation 19, we read this incredible description, and then these are the words. And you get to wear fine linen, and the linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The righteous deeds of the saints. I believe it's 19.8. 19.8, the righteous deeds of the saints. So let me try to illustrate it, and then we'll go home. Imagine for a moment that everything I'm wearing right now 
is the righteousness that we get from Jesus Christ. That's the wedding garment. And then the fine linen is the work that you did for the Lord that goes with you for all eternity. So he creates this visual picture in the book of Revelation of having a wedding garment, which is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ through faith in the gospel. And then you say, what does it matter what I do for the kingdom of God? Everything that you do for the kingdom of God follows you into eternity. And it's described as fine linen, fine linen. So it's the jacket that you put on at the end and the lapel and everything's just right. And now you're completely clothed. You have the righteousness that you received from Jesus Christ and the good deeds that you did during your lifetime go with you into eternity. And that person is blessed. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for our time together. And we went way over. And God, we would just call you to impress upon any heart that's not here faith in the gospel. We pray, God, that if there's an unbeliever here, that they would be converted. In Jesus' name, amen.